Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Crinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It happens tens of thousands of times every single day in every part of the world, and it has always been so. Every day, children are born. People have babies. Now, when that's close to your family, those are very special events, right? I have been accused of seven months of putting pictures up of my granddaughter, and for the record, this is the first time, and I just decided if I'm going to be accused, I'm going to be guilty. <laughs> so there she is. And when that little girl was born in May of this year, I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters, very first grandbaby, that was special to our family. But the truth is, on that day in May, she was just one of thousands that were born. And to everybody else in the world, the birth of that little baby was just one of those ordinary things that happens every single day. Though I would add she is the cutest of all the babies that were born on that day. And everybody's wondering, she came from Jonathan? We've wondered about that too. But if it is true that that is an ordinary thing that happens every single day, and unless it's close to your family, it's not that all remarkable, it does make you wonder about this one, the one we just read about. And what was so extraordinary about the birth of that child in that little backwater of Bethlehem? The artist would lead us to believe that somehow the scene itself betrayed its significance. Can you see it in the picture? The heavenly spotlight coming from somewhere, shining down on this child with a golden aura around its head. Even the animals seem to understand that something extraordinary has taken place. They look on in awe. It's on all the Christmas cards, right? And I suspect not even close to reality. I suspect that the scene was far more ordinary. A young, poor woman goes into labor while traveling out of town and is forced to give birth in less than idea circumstances. I doubt that there was anything that made people look on that scene and see something beyond just something really ordinary. And yet it was anything but ordinary. What do you say about a birth that split history into two pieces? No human being has had a greater impact on the history of humanity than the one that was born on this occasion, even the most strident atheist cannot quibble about the impact of this child on the world. One writer said of Jesus, here is a man who grew up in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman, 
He grew up in another village, worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30, and then for three years was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home. He never had a family of his own. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials. While he was still a young man, the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through a mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while dying, his executioners gambled for the one thing on earth that he owned. A coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed tomb through the pity of a friend. And yet, the author continues, I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever set, and all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man upon this earth as this one solitary life. And from the beginning, we knew it would be so. From the moment he came into the world, there were all these amazing things that told us this birth, this child was anything but ordinary. And so, since if at no other time of year people today are thinking about the birth of Jesus, I want us to think about the birth of Jesus. And the things that surrounded this extraordinary extraordinary occasion that tell to us, tell us that it was extraordinary. That this was no ordinary child. This was no ordinary birth. Will you notice with me why that's so? Let me begin with this. Let me begin by asking you to notice that the birth of Jesus was actually was actually foretold by the prophets. You know, once a child is conceived, we have a pretty good idea about when to expect its arrival, right? Usually after conception, it's going to be it's going to be in the 9-month neighborhood and that baby's going to be here. And yet And yet the arrival of Jesus on the scene, that was anticipated not for months, but for years, even centuries. In fact, we began to anticipate Jesus all the way back at the beginning, back in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, you remember after Adam and Eve sin and, and God is cursing the serpent, he, he says that one day the seed of woman would come and, and bruise the serpent on the head, deal Satan a death blow, and tucked in that statement is a prophecy about this child that was coming. Later in Genesis, in chapter 12, in verse 3, as God is making a series of promises to Abraham, he says in verse 3 of Genesis 12, in you, in your family, from your descendants, will come a blessing of all to all the families on the earth. And so tucked there is a promise about this child who would come into the world. And before we're done with Genesis, in chapter 49, and in verse number 10, Judah is told that the scepter would not depart from him until he who comes to whom it belongs. Who was that? It was this child it was anticipating Jesus. And as we go on through the Old Testament, the prophets become, become more specific and more dramatic. Moses in Deuteronomy 18 announced that one day a prophet would come greater than him and like him who would speak God's will to his people. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, Micah announces the birthplace. Bethlehem, a city of David. That was announced by the prophets. In Isaiah Isaiah chapter 53, the prophet announced that the Savior would come and would suffer and die and in so doing bear the sins of the people. And finally in Daniel 2, verse 44, Daniel announced that his coming would usher in a great kingdom that would endure forever. Do you see it? 
throughout the Old Testament. The prophets, the prophets saw this child who was coming, and they told us many details about, about what his coming into the world would be like. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, that's not enough. What we really need to say is that the whole flow of the Old Testament is all heading to this moment of time. Everything in the old pointed to that time when this child would come into the world. This is no ordinary child. This is no ordinary birth. And we know that not just because of what the prophet said. Let's add this. We know that because this child, this child existed before his birth, before his conception. When I say to you that I was born on October 4th, 1964, you know what that means, right? Do, quit doing the math. I'm 53. I still own that, okay? If you do want to mark down October 4th, that's a good day to have in your calendar, by the way. But you know what I mean when I say that I was born on October 4th. That means that's when I, when I began to exist, or more correctly, roughly nine months prior to October 4th, I began to exist, right? That's not true of Jesus. Even though Jesus experienced the same birth process that all of us went through, that's not when he began to exist. In fact, Jesus claimed to have existed before Mary's pregnancy. In fact, he claimed to have existed before Mary. In fact, if you look at John chapter 8, you're grinning, Wesley. You knew I was going there, didn't you? Wesley's one step ahead of me this morning. In John chapter 8, when he's arguing with his enemies, Jesus claims to have existed before Abraham. John 8 and verse 58, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. In John chapter 1, John would say that Jesus, Jesus was present at the creation. In John 17 and verse 5, he says that he existed before the world was. I want you to notice that language back in John 8 and verse 58. It just sounds grammatically wrong, doesn't it? Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Am. What does that mean? It's actually language that takes us back to the Old Testament. Back to the book of Exodus when Moses met God on Mount Sinai. Do you remember that story? And one of the issues that comes up there in Exodus chapter 3 is, is Moses asks, the people are going to want to know, they want to know your name. Who sent me? Remember what God's answer is? You tell the people, I am sent you. It is language that implies the eternity of God, that God has always existed. You see it? But when you get John chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus takes that language and he applies it to himself. Before Abraham was born, I am. Also then claiming to be eternal applying to himself a quality that belongs only to God. And listen, his enemies understand perfectly where he was going with that because in verse 59 it says, Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went into the temple. Why would they pick up rocks? Because they were going to kill him. They were going to execute him on the spot for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. His conception and birth marked the beginning of his life in the flesh. But it was not his beginning. Jesus didn't have one. Like the Father, he is eternal. This is no ordinary child, folks. This is no ordinary birth. In fact, because we know he preexisted his birth and conception, let's add this to the list. Let's add thirdly, that he was going to have to be conceived by a miracle, right? I mean, if he already existed before his conception, then he is not going to be able to come into the world through the normal human reproduction process, right? It wouldn't be possible for, for him to come into the world in the ordinary way. It would require something special, and that's exactly what the prophets tell us to anticipate. So I'm back in Isaiah. Go, go to the book of Isaiah. Look in Isaiah chapter 7. 
in Isaiah 7, down in verse number 14, the prophet, the prophet says, speaking of Jesus coming, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Remember, we already said the prophets, the prophets, the deeper we go, begin to tell us all kinds of amazing things about this one who is coming. Here we're told how he would come into the world, that he would be born of a virgin. And then we go over to Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 1, and that's exactly what happens according to Matthew. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, the text says, this is Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, right? You understand what that means? Before they came together, she was found to be with child, notice, by the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you read on in the context, that creates some drama. Because here's Joseph engaged to this woman who turns up pregnant. And what does he assume? And the Holy Spirit has to intervene and say, it's not what you've assumed. It's the work of God. In fact, if you look at verse 22 of Matthew 1, the text says, Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And here it is, verse 23. This is Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, The virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. All of it happened exactly according to God's plan. This child child came into the world as it must through a miracle. This is no ordinary child. This is no ordinary birth. And we know that because forth, It is attended by all kinds of amazing events. When the time comes for Jesus to to be born into the world, all these amazing, even bizarre things begin to happen. Will you go back to Luke 2? I'll give you a couple of examples. This one from Luke 2 and verse 8. How about the experience of the shepherds that night he was born? Luke 2 verse 8 tells their story. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws, lying in a manger. Then listen to 13. And suddenly there appeared with uh, with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. What an extraordinary event. The shepherds seeing this heavenly announcement of the birth of this child. And that's not the only one. Look over at Matthew chapter 2 for a minute. Go back there. The second event I would point you to is the visit of the Magi. Matthew tells us about that in Matthew 2 and verse 1. Now, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. I will tell you, brothers and sisters, that's a part of the story that we typically just blitz right over and hardly give a thought to. Would you pause with me for a moment and think about how utterly bizarre this piece of his story is? Who are these magi? We don't really know, except that they've come from the east. There are some who who connect them to the Persians, some who connect them to the Babylonians. But the truth is, other than that they came from the east, that's about it. That's all we know. I don't think those are the more interesting questions, though. How did they know about Jesus? 
And what's the deal with this star? How did that work? And how did they know to follow the star? And why did they pack up and come what was surely a lengthy journey for them? They weren't there the night he was born, okay? The Christmas cards have that wrong. What would move them to do such a thing? To come and to bring gifts. You ever wondered about all that? Someone says, they must have had a revelation of God. I think we'll agree on that. But who and how and when? Oh, folks, there is a mystery that hangs over these visitors that we are incapable of unraveling. Except to say this. I think they do tell us two things. Number one, I think the Magi tell us that the birth of this child was not just important to the Jews, but was important to all men over the earth. And you and I are grateful for that this morning, aren't we? And their arrival on the scene, guided there by that star, tells us this is no ordinary child. This is no ordinary birth. When he comes into the world, all these amazing things begin to happen. And then add to that, that all these amazing things begin to be said. There are just some stunning proclamations that accompany the birth of Jesus. You ever thought about that? Let me give you a sample. In Matthew 1 and verse 23, Matthew quotes Isaiah. We saw that a minute ago who said the child will be called Emmanuel, a name that means what? God with us. Think about that. Gabriel, in Luke 1 and verse 32, told Mary that her child would be called Son of the Most High. In Luke 2 and verse 11, an angel, the angel announced to the shepherds that a Savior Christ the Lord had been born in the city of David. Gabriel told Mary in Luke 1 and verse 32 that her child would be given the throne of David and would reign over the house of Jacob and that there would be no end of his kingdom. Hmm, kind of makes us think of Daniel 2, doesn't it? In Luke chapter 2 and verse 29, Mary and Joseph go and present Jesus at the temple, and more things begin to happen. Simeon approaches them, a man who had been promised that he would not see death until he had seen the Messiah. In Matthew 1 and verse 21, Joseph is told by the angel that this baby would save his people from their sins. This is no ordinary child. This is no ordinary birth. And we know that. We know that sixth because when he came into the world, he faced vicious opposition. We see that. We see that from the very beginning. In fact, Isaiah told us it would be so. Will you go back to Isaiah chapter 53 for a minute? In Isaiah 53 and verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. There are hints in the prophets that trouble is coming. And it did. When we get to Matthew chapter 2, and the wise men, the magi, arrive on the scene. Verse 2 says that they start asking, where is the king of the Jews? Verse 3 says, when Herod heard this, he was troubled. Herod would have no rival. And when someone came looking for the king of the Jews, Herod was upset by that. And when Herod was upset, everybody was upset. They had a reason to be. He was a vile and violent man. He wanted these magi to let him know where that child was. And when they did not, when they did not agree and give him what he wanted, verse 16 says, 
And when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and he sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined for the Magi. What a horrific scene. The murder of babies. I will tell you, brothers and sisters, as tragic as tragic and awful as that was, it was only the beginning. And starting at the point the opposition to Jesus would grow and become increasingly violent until it culminates in the cross. In fact, just saying that, I don't think it's saying enough. It's not completing the story because the truth of the matter is behind the scenes there's a battle going on. Jesus is being brought into the world by his Father to be the Savior and to rescue men from sins. But there is an enemy who's doing everything he can all the way through this process to prevent that from happening. In fact, in Revelation chapter 12, using imagery, John perfectly describes the spiritual war behind the scenes between God and Satan, with God working out his purpose and the devil doing everything that he can to put a halt to what the Father is trying to do for us. The coming of Jesus into the world, we are reaching the climactic moment of a great spiritual war. And brothers and sisters, there were many casualties. This was no ordinary child. This was no ordinary birth. Because this child was born to die. I guess people have kids for a lot of different reasons. I think some people have kids because they want the companionship that comes with children. They want to they want to share their life with somebody. I think some some are are not thinking more about this life but making thinking more about after this life. That after they're gone they want to have kids so that they they will leave a legacy, leave something of themselves behind when they're gone. In fact, in fact for some disciples there may be a spiritual dimension to that legacy. Maybe maybe they're thinking I want to leave someone behind who will carry on the work of God and, and spread this message and and expand the kingdom when I'm not here to do that anymore. People have children, I guess, for a lot of different reasons. You realize that Mary and Joseph did not have a reason for having Jesus. Uh, They didn't have a choice in the matter. In fact, what happened was God chose them to bring his son into the world. And why did he do that? Ladies and gentlemen, he was born to die. We are all born dying, right? That's kind of a morbid thought, I know, but it's nonetheless true. From the, from the moment your heart beats for the first time, and from that moment you draw your first breath, we begin the countdown clock. It's ticking to that moment in time when we will take our last breath and our heart will beat for the final time. We are all born dying. But you understand that's not what I'm saying about Jesus, right? He wasn't born dying as we all are. He was born to die. That was his purpose for coming. The prophets announced it. So you know I'm going back to Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53 and verse 7, the prophet says that he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers. He did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation who who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, and yet he was with, with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. We read the prophets, and it's there. He's coming to die. Jesus understood that. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, Matthew tells us how he began to tell his disciples that they're going to go up to Jerusalem. 
And he's going to be killed. They're going to put him to death. Imagine that. That Jesus lived every day knowing that he was on the countdown clock and that the cross was coming. That's why he came. In John 1 and verse 29, John the Baptist says of Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why do you call Jesus a lamb? LJ, you've been ahead of me all morning, brother. Oh, no, you're good. He said it. He's going to be the lamb offered for the sins of man. This is no ordinary child. This is no ordinary birth. This child was born to die. And you already knew that. I'm preaching to a crowd of people who are sitting in a church building on December 24th. You knew that this was no ordinary child. No ordinary birth. Here's my question for me and you. Do we treat it that way? You realize that if I refuse to believe in Jesus as my Savior and refuse to submit to His will for for my life to have the salvation that He offers, to repent of my sins and to be baptized for the remission of my sins, if I refuse to do all of that, in essence what I'm saying is that I look back on this scene and I say just an ordinary birth, just another child. Or maybe I've done that. Maybe I made a commitment that I was going to follow Jesus, that I would be his servant. And yet, and yet my life does not look like that. I say he's my king, but he's not ruling every day in my life. Listen, if I don't make him king over me and what I do, I'm in essence looking back on that scene and saying it was just another birth. He's just another child. I guess what we're saying in essence, brothers and sisters, is that is that it all comes down, my life comes down to this question. What do I believe about that baby in the manger? Was it just another child? Was it just another birth? Was it ordinary? Or did something extraordinary world-changing, life-changing for me happened in that little backwater of Bethlehem. If that's what you believe needs to change your world today, if you've not been living for him, own that child as your king, change your ways. We'd like to help you do that. If you've never believed in him and been baptized because he said so for the forgiveness of your, of your sin, make that child your Savior. Show this morning that you believe that those events in Bethlehem were extraordinary events that changed the world, and now they're going to change your life. Would you make the choice to do that? If you need to respond to him, you make your way to the front right now. While we stand, while we sing.